Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you because we know that you are our healer. We know that you are awesome God. And Lord, we do. We acknowledge that if, if you are with us, if you are for us, then it really doesn't matter who is against us. Help us to always walk in assurance, the confidence that you are God, are for us, that you are God, you are with us. So that way, as we walk, as we live, as we move, we not only have this assurance, we have the hope that no matter what comes against us, no matter what stands in front of us, no matter who it is that at times will try to come alongside to distract us, if you are God, are with us, then we are on our way to walking out not only your will, but to walking out in a way that brings glory and honor to you. Thank you for the conviction. Thank you for the assurance. Thank you for the hope that we can only have in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. All God's people said amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated at this time as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Some of you are familiar with what takes place in the Gospel of John, but also in the other Gospels there in the Bible, the New Testament. We know, as we have read, as we have heard, as many of us have seen it depicted on movie after movie, that on that faithful evening, that last supper with his disciples before going to the cross, Jesus will gather them all around after this meal in this room, and then he will say to them as he grabs this bread, he will say, this, this bread represents my body, my body which is being broken and bruised for you. Jesus would then say to his disciples that this cup here, this cup represents my blood, which is being shed for you and the forgiveness of your sins. He would go on to say that as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do some remembrance of me. Now, the good news is Jesus does not mandate or require that we do this every time that we come into his house or the church house with his people, but he informs us to do it. And that whenever we do, we we do it in remembrance of him. While it is also true that at times, many of us who come to church for years, sometimes in our own minds, we get tired of hearing the same message around Easter and around Christmas time. Sometimes we get a little bit kind of like dealing with a sense of monotony with the fact that this same message of Jesus coming, Jesus shedding his blood, Jesus dying on the cross, We get to the point where it's as if our ears become dull of hearing it and we no longer shout or get excited. But at the end of the day, you and I need to be reminded that the greatest miracle in your life or the moment that God rescued you from whatever disaster was on your way to, you never get tired of telling the story. And you don't want people to get tired of hearing the fact that God has not just delivered, but delivered you specifically. So it is that every first Sunday, for the most part, when we gather together, we take time to take part in our service with regards to the Lord's Supper to not only remind all of us, but to inform some of you for the first time that Jesus came, Jesus died, that Jesus has shed his blood to save your souls from sin. And so I hope that you would be encouraged by this moment that we get to take in our service to pause and to reflect, to remember, but also to rejoice over the fact that there was a God who sits high but looks low and decided to involve himself into the affairs of men because he wanted to save as many men as possible if you would simply believe. This morning, if we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we prepare to remember the work that Christ has done on the cross to save us from our sins. I want to give you just a few instructions. Number one, we believe that communion is for baptized believers, which means if you have not been baptized, then please do not partake. You can watch. You can be reminded, but we ask that you please do not partake. If you have children who are in the sanctuary who have not been baptized, then please govern yourself accordingly. For those of us who are taking this morning, I want you to take a moment before we take the Lord's Supper to reflect over your life. 
ask for some forgiveness of any sins that have gone uh, uh, unrepentant for in your life today. Be thankful for the fact that whether you've asked for it or not, if you are a believer, you've gotten it. You asking for it is just simply you going through the process of reminding you who God is and that you ought to ask him for what it is that you want and you need, regardless of the fact that he may be giving it or have given it already. But I also pray and ask that in this time we also rejoice. Rejoice over what? That in one death it eliminates the many deaths. For in Christ's death on the cross, his blood being shed, while you and I live on this earth and we may leave this earth, the Bible declares that as a believer, you don't die. You just simply fall asleep. Awaiting to wake up the other side of heaven, but also awaiting the return of Christ, that you may come back with him as he not only brings you back to unite your body with your soul, but as he also calls those up from the earth who have not yet passed, who will not fall asleep as we worship him for eternity in heaven. Please take a moment to pause, to not only hear the words of a song, but also to reflect on the life that was given for you. Every head bow, every eye close. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together as we remember the life and the death of Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to find ourselves being more reflective and more thankful for the life in which we have been given by faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. May you forever be glorified. And may we forever, forever walk in humility and faithfulness to you. Search our hearts. Continue to purify us as only you can do. As you teach us, Lord, to trust you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears and it dries all my tears the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from death It's power. 
And so it was on that faithful night that Jesus, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to each of his disciples, and he told them to take and eat. Shall we eat together? Can we say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. In a similar manner, he took the cup, and he said to his disciples, this cup represents my blood, which is being shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Shall we drink together? And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Our Father and our God in heaven, we again thank you for this opportunity to not only gather together, but to pause in the midst of our service, to take a moment to remember the life of our Lord and our Savior, our God, Jesus Christ. But I pray and ask that just as you have shared with us to do this, and when we do it, we're remembering you, that in this you have also been honored in our remembrance of you. Lord, I thank you that you provide this moment we get to reflect on the real weight of our sin, but also the reality that this is not a weight we no longer have to carry. For you have carried it for us if we simply are willing to believe in you and the work that you have done in dying on the cross. But Lord, this morning we also rejoice. We rejoice over the fact that not only have you come and that you have died, but you have taken up the weight and responsibility of our sin, and therefore we no longer have to not only carry it, but we get the excitement of knowing that the hope that we have in Christ is that we will not die, but we will only fall asleep. That we will be with you in eternity, rejoicing and celebrating and worshiping you because you are worthy of it all. And so, Lord, I pray and ask that even right now, that we will begin to practice here on earth what we would do forever, for eternity in heaven. And that is to rejoice and to worship you, our great God. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for this moment of reflection, remembrance, and rejoicing. And Lord, now we pray and ask that our worship service will continue to bring glory and honor to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Listen, it is an honor, it is labor of love to not only be in this position, but to serve you all. Here at Kingdom Life Church in the city of Lansing. It is an honor. It's a privilege. So thank you. All right. Going to the next slide. Last thing I want to share with you is October the 28th will be our trunk or treat. This thing is actually turning more to like a harvest fest, y'all. Like we want not only to give out candy, but we're trying to partner with, we have partnered with the churches. We're going to have hay rides down at the church property. We're trying to get some bounce houses out there. And so this is more like, uh, like a harvest fall fest slash trunk or treat Saturday, October the 28th. Now we need people to volunteer to sign up to actually help out with this. We will not be alone. We are partnering again with another church, City Life, as well as a couple other organizations and entities throughout our city in order to make this a successful event. Now, something else I need outside outside of just volunteers, we need a lot more candy. A lot more candy than what we expected. Normally, we do this event here at the church, and we have asked and challenged you to bring candy uh, leading up to this event. And I'm going to be very clear about this. Every year, most years, because all these people show up, we still have to then go out and purchase more candy in order to complete the event, okay? So in purchasing candy uh, for this entire month, I want you to purchase, you know, let's have more than enough, right? Let's have more than enough to make sure we can give it out and whatever's left over, there'll be like lots of scraps to be taken up. Just like when Jesus takes the two fish and multiplies it, it's so much left over that everybody gets a little bit extra, okay? And so let, let's, let's be very much intentional about trying to do our best Amen. to be a blessing to our community, yeah. all right? To be a blessing to our community. So volunteers sign up, bring some candy, and know it's going to be an awesome time October the 28th for our trunk or treat. All right, that is all the announcements that we have, oh, books are available for Loving Your Community, which is what our current sermon series is based on here with regards to Establish the City. As we move into today's sermon, I want to just give you a brief overview of where we have been as we prepare to, with regards to where we are going. We have been in this sermon series uh, entitled Establish the City, and we got in this sermon series simply because the the Lord laid on my heart through the conviction of Deacon Bombi 
uh, this particular idea, this thought. He went to Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 7, about five, six weeks ago, and he began to preach on the significance of not only how God had worked in his heart and his mind to make him more accountable to getting involved or to actually seeking the welfare of the city, that in that moment that he was preaching, I was tremendously challenged, and therefore, this sermon series was birthed out of that. For those of you, this is your first Sunday. Here is a summer where we've been thus far. In Jeremiah chapter 29, God says this in verse 5, 6, and 7. He makes a statement here in Jeremiah 29, verse 5. He says to the people of Israel these words. He says, uh, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Verse number six, he will go on to say, take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Verse seven, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray for the Lord on its behalf, for in his welfare will be your welfare, or for in its welfare, you will have welfare. In that particular first week, I said that there are three things in which we can see or take or glean from Jeremiah chapter 29, specifically verse 7, but also 5, 6, and 7. Those three things were simply this, establish uh, prosperity or provision, excuse me. The Israelites are to establish a sense of security in having a job and building a home. Provision. Secondly, establish posterity. Go ahead and procreate. Make babies, lots of them, and then allow your babies to make babies in the land in which you are in. Thirdly, establish prosperity. And the prosperity is not so much for themselves, but it is for the city in which they are in. What city is this? The city of their exile. You see, the early Israelites or the ancient Israelites at this time in their history had been in Babylonian captivity for a couple of years. They didn't like Babylonian captivity. They wanted to be free from that and to go back home to Israel, back to Jerusalem. In fact, because Babylonia was having some issues, many of the people believed that their issues were due to God's judgment on them, and therefore God was going to deliver Israel from Babylonian captivity. Some of the prophets who were prophesying during that time told the people of Israel, not too long from now, and God's going to bring you back home. And this is where God uses the prophet Jeremiah to write what we just saw in Jeremiah 29, verses 5, 6, and 7. In that sense, we want you to build a house, get a job, get married, and give your children a marriage, and then pray for or intercede on the welfare of the city, because in its welfare is your welfare. In the city of the exile that I have sent you, God has sent them there, which means God wanted them to know they needed to settle in, because they weren't going anywhere anytime soon. So... He wanted them to what? establish this sense of provision, establish this sense of posterity, and to establish this concept of uh, 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 prosperity for the city. I gave them to you this way. Invest themselves or ourselves in the city. Integrate their families or our families within the city in which we live, and therefore intercede on behalf of the city. Why am I sharing this with you? Because if God has placed you somewhere, Wherever he's placed you, whether it is the neighborhood you live in, the job in which you work, the church you are now a part of, or in our case, the city that we now find ourselves dwelling in. God wants his people to infiltrate that community, to infiltrate that group of individuals and people in order to not only be salt and light, but to bring them the hope of Jesus Christ that has been brought into your life. This sermon series has been built on this concept of you and I taking up the responsibility that God has given us not only individually but collectively to actually seek the best for the city in which we are in. Why? Because when we do that, not only will our city be better, but we too will be better. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Use your word as a way to not only encourage our hearts, but to strengthen us, drawing us closer and closer to you as we seek to obey and to walk wholly before you. I pray and ask, O oh God in heaven, that you'd remove me, allow your Holy Spirit to take over, so that it's not my truth, but your truth, not my word, but your words. But I pray and ask that all of your people today, this morning, are edified, and you are a great God in heaven, you are glorified. 
asking all these things and believing them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. All God's people said, amen. Last week we discussed, well, the last two weeks we discussed the, uh, the event that took place, one of the events that took place in Abraham's life, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, for those of you who were here the last two weeks, you saw how Abraham interceded on behalf of a city that was very wicked, Sodom and Gomorrah. We also saw in that first week that Abraham not only interceded, taking it upon himself to intercede on their behalf, but, but he works out this negotiation with God that if God can find 50 righteous, he will not destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of the 50 righteous. I told you then that part of what Abraham does is instead of focusing on the wickedness in the city, he focuses on the righteousness within the city. By focusing on the righteousness, you and I are better equipped to therefore pray to God, appeal to him to ask that people or a city be saved because we're focused on what is right as opposed to what is wrong. There will always be more of what's wrong with something than, more than, than what is right. But if you and I can focus on what is good, then you and I have a standing chance to make it better. For instance, some of you are in marriages or in jobs or maybe in places where you're not really that happy. Part of the reason why you remain unhappy is because you continue to focus on what you don't have instead of what you do have. Instead of focusing on where you're going and where you want to be, you stay focused on where you are at. And so oftentimes, you and I need to be reminded to look forward to where we want to go and what we want in this life, to the hope that we have as opposed to the hurt that we are currently dealing with. Abraham will negotiate with God in Genesis chapter 19, and then God will say to Abraham, if I can find 50 righteous, then I will not destroy the city. Well, God then, as he is preparing his angels to go into the city, Abraham says, wait, hold up, hold up. What about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? Abraham negotiates this deal down to 10. 10 righteous people, and the whole city will be spared. Last week, you saw that while Abraham did his part to intercede, God still destroys the city. Why? Because he cannot find 10 righteous people within the city, and therefore its destruction is inevitable. Abraham will look out onto the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah one morning when he gets up and realizes that the city has been destroyed. And then we begin to ponder what he must have been feeling when he realized that his intercession, his prayers, his hope of saving the city was not met with its salvation, but still met with destruction. What do you do when you're interceding and your prayers, the, the hope that you had for the city does not work out the way in which you want it? But if you read too quickly, we miss in verse 28 and 29 where it says, but God remembered Abraham and rescued Lot. Therefore, while it would appear as if Abraham was not heard, the reality of it is, is God, while he did not save the city because he could not find the ten righteous, he did save the one righteous from the wicked city in his destruction. So you have no idea that while God may not save the city, he may still spare some individuals in the city all because you prayed on behalf of the city. Today I want you to see what the exact opposite of that is. When God's people decide not to intercede or not to intervene because we do not want what God wants, we want what we want. Our story opens up in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1, as we read these words. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Here in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, we get introduction of our prophet, the preacher, the individual whom God is going to work through and has been working through and also utilize to bring about his plan and his will. We not only get the name of the prophet Jonah, we also get his daddy's name, the son of Amittai. We do not know much about Amittai other than the fact that he is the father of Jonah. And while there is one other reference to this particular individual or name, Amittai, we're not sure if it's the same individual or not. So we do not get much detail about his background or his upbringing, but what we do know is that he is a prophet that has been called and sent by God. Here you see titled initial imperatives. Why? Because in verse 2, there are some initial imperatives, commands that God gives to Jonah, his prophet. The first command is the first word, arise. God basically says, get up, Jonah. So I'm not sure if Jonah was resting one morning and as he opened up his eyes, he heard the voice of God say, get up. Not sure if he was praying in his prayer closet, doing his morning devotion, and God said, get up off your knees. I got a plan for you to do. But the point being here is, the first imperative me is God saying to Jonah, get up. It's important for you and I to realize that because oftentimes God does not want you and I just to do something from a position of laying down or sitting somewhere. He often wants us to get up and get involved. 
get up, arise. Then he says, go. You see, oftentimes you and I don't mind getting up, but we definitely don't want to go. He says, go, and he tells him to go where? To Nineveh, the great city. Now, in order for the context, you need to understand that Nineveh was a wicked city, an enemy of Israel. They did not like Israelites, and they did not worship Israel's God. In essence, they were a people. They were a nation who were not only opposed to God, but also opposed to the people of God, Israel. Let me remind you, you live in a city. You live in a country that although it says in God we trust on our money, in ultimate reality, we don't really trust in the God that we say we trust in. We simply trust in whatever we put in front of him and then try to add his name to it later. But you and I understand that there are times where you say you trust God, but that is until God tells you to do something that you don't want to do. So, arise, go to Nineveh, this great city, this great city does not like you, does not like me, and I want you to, the third imperative, cry out against her. Cry out means pronounce judgment. Tell her, tell this city and the people, I am not happy with them. And so I'm not just telling you to get up and to go. I'm telling you to get up and go with a message from me. This is very similar to what we see in Genesis chapter 19 when God says to Abraham that he is going to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah because their wickedness has come up before me. In essence, it is saying this, that The wickedness in a place is so bad that it has finally come up to my nostrils and it stinks to high heaven. Let me put it to you like this. God cannot be in the presence of sin. He does not like being around sin. Why? Because he's a holy God. To give you a better example of this, imagine for a moment that the person sitting next to you did not shower last night before they came to church this morning. Now, for the most part, you might be okay because one shower last night missing it may not hurt you at all, but it would definitely start to impact you, especially if you didn't get up this morning and do something about it. But what if the person sitting next to you decided they weren't going to shower for the next week? Well, I'm here to tell you, you wouldn't want to sit next to them next week. If a month or two months goes by, at that point, none of us want to sit next to them. In fact, we would put loudspeakers outside so that way they could stand outside while the rest of us were inside. In essence, the longer you go without a shower, the more and more you stink. The more and more you walk in sin, the greater it is where God now says to himself, I'm beginning to smell you because you stink to high heaven. Your odor has gotten so bad that even though you're there on earth, I can smell it way up here in heaven. God is saying to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh and cry out against her. Why? Because her sin, her wickedness has made it up into heaven. Three imperatives there. Get up, go, proclaim this message that I am not satisfied with them. We read in verse number three some interesting words. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is interesting. How in the world do you run from God's presence? I mean, God is everywhere, isn't he? You know, he sees you no matter where you go. Here the text says that Jonah rises up to flee from the presence of God by going to a place called Tarshish, which is not Nineveh. It says here he goes, he went down to Joppa, which is a seaport. He found a ship. He paid the fare. He got in the boat to go with the men who were going to Tarshish to what? To flee from the presence of the Lord. Now don't miss that. He's fleeing from the presence of the Lord twice in the same verse, all right? First of all, I don't care how far you run or where you go, you cannot really run from God. He always sees you, all right? That's like me sitting up here saying to y'all, I want to hide from y'all. Can y'all see me? In essence, no matter where you go, no matter how far you run, God will always see you. But the point here is when it says that he is fleeing from the presence of the Lord, Jonah has made a decision, and his decision is to do the exact opposite of what God has asked him to do. Jonah actually, instead of going the 500 miles north to get to Nineveh, actually goes south, finds a port, jumps on a boat in J- from Joppa to actually sail across the sea to get as far away from God's intended destiny or destination as he can, all right? All right? So, so Jonah basically goes to the ends of the earth as he knows it in the opposite direction. Anybody ever decided that God wanted one thing, but you wanted what you wanted so badly, you were going to walk in the opposite direction, therefore God could not make you do what he wanted you to do? You see, some of you recognize that at times God will drag you to the place that he wants you to go if you're close enough to it. So imagine running in the opposite direction, trying to do all that you can to escape 
God's direction for your life. Let me be clear. Jonah is deliberately disobedient to God's divine decree. He makes a decision to deliberately disobey God. You've seen The Lion King. When Simba decides to go down to the place he's not to go down to, he almost dies in that stampede because Uncle Scar tries to take his life. And when his father hears, he runs down there to try to rescue his son. And he's looking from the mountaintop, and he sees Simba. He has to run down in there and, and, to, and to rescue him. I'm sorry, that's the wrong scene. He actually rescued him from those hyenas before all this. And he tells, he tells his son Simba, after he rescues him from the hyenas, he says, Simba, you deliberately disobeyed me. And it's the voice of James Earl Jones, y'all. So it's more like, you deliberately disobeyed. It's that deep, manly voice, right? When you and I are deliberate in our disobedience, that means you are upright, defiant, almost shaking your fist at God. Like, how dare you tell me to do A when I want to do B? Some of you got up this morning and, and, and you almost deliberately disobeyed. God said, go on to church. And you're like, I don't feel like it. It's the, I'm tired. It was a late, 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 night, late, late night last night. Some of y'all was watching football. Probably not the Spartans, but, you know, it's all good. Um, some of you were up late. You got up this morning, and you did not feel like going. But you're here this morning. I know because we ain't had this many people in church in the last several weeks. I'm kind of excited, all right? I'm excited that all of y'all decided to hear the Lord and obey him instead of those who deliberately disobeyed him and stayed at home, all right? Deliberate disobedience. When it's like you shaking your fist at God and saying, because I do not want what you want, I will not do what you are asking me to do. Not only do we see deliberate disobedience to a divine decree here, but we also see that Jonah has no desire. No desire at all to submit to God's divine decision. When I say no desire, it's not that he doesn't love God. It's not that he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do in other areas, but he does not want to do what God wants in this area. And this is important because Jonah is the prophet. He's the preacher, which means he belongs to the Lord. He has been led by the Lord, and the Lord at times has used him in order to get his will done, and Jonah has been obedient. But in this moment, in this situation, Jonah does not want to walk in obedience. Let me ask you a question. What is it in your life that God is trying to get you not to do that you are still doing? What is it that God is trying to get you potentially to, to give up that you just refuse to give up? Where is he sending you? We just say, I just can't go. And then why are you not going? What are your motivations, your reasons for simply deciding to deliberately disobey a divine decree? Now, I know for some of you, you're saying, well, Pastor Boyer, I'm not really, I don't know what I'm deliberately disobedient about because I don't know the Bible that well. Okay, we'll start with what you know. Pick it up and start to find out some more so that way you, should know, you can know which direction you should go. At the end of the day, you and I do not want to be found either like Jonah, deliberately disobeying because we know the truth, or like Nineveh, who is walking in disobedience and wickedness because they do not know the truth. Jonah has no desire to submit to God's divine decision. We read on in verses 4 and the following. We now move from the standpoint of Jonah making a deliberate decision to disobey God's divine decree to God's response, or I should say dramatic responses to Jonah's decision. It says, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Now, I love this particular verse because it gives us the indication, the idea in verse number 4, that God is like a pitcher. He is is throwing a wind onto the sea. And let me tell you something. When God throws a fastball, oh, that's going to be a fastball right there, all right? It says he hurls, all right? Hurls is this idea where he is flinging this wind onto the sea. You notice something about this wind? Guess what? It obeys God. It goes right where it was intended to go. The wind does not decide midair that it's going to shift its direction and go in a direction that the Lord had not intended. So the Lord throws or hurls, the wind goes. Where does the wind go? To the sea. How does the sea respond? Oh, a storm strikes up on the sea. So not only does the wind respond, but a storm 
storm is now initiated. The sea is now rocking. The boat says it's beginning to break up. And specifically in the Hebrew, it says the boat is now threatening to come apart. In essence, the boat cannot speak, yet in its actions it is speaking because it is beginning to come apart at the seams. I wonder how in the world is it that the wind responds, the sea responds, the doggone boat responds, but the prophet of God will not respond appropriately to God's word and his will. The boat begins to break up. You know why some of you have so much drama in your life? Because God is trying to get your attention. And everybody and everything around you is responding to God except for you. Why? Because you've decided not to do what he told you to do in the first place. And therefore, you find yourself in a situation where everybody around you is responding appropriately except for you. Now, I know some of you are reading this and say, Pastor, I don't see the people responding appropriately. I just see inanimate objects such as wind, storm, uh, and boat. Well, read verse 5. All of a sudden, it goes on to say, the sailors became afraid. Now, these are ungodly pagan men, don't know Jonah, don't know Jonah's God, and they are not Israelites. They all cried out to their own gods. That's how I know they don't know uh, Jonah's God because they're crying to their own gods. And they then threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Now, I love this. These men are so afraid of what is happening because this storm has all of a sudden arisen on the sea. These would have been trained and skilled men in the boat as well as selling the sea, and they would have dealt with storms prior to this one. However, something different about this storm. How do we know? Because these jokers are throwing the cargo in the ship into the sea. You know what cargo represents, right? That's your money. That's the whole reason for the trip in the first place. If they arrive with no cargo, they do not get paid, which means it was a wasted trip and a wasted sense of energy and time because they would get nothing out of it. I'm here to tell you, situation get bad enough, though, you will give up all the money in your pockets because you want to save your life. This particular storm has gotten so bad, all of a sudden, that the men recognize this ain't no normal storm. This is God talking. The question is, are we listening? I want to save my life so badly, I'm willing to throw overboard the whole reason why I got on this ship in the first place. And so... Everyone and everything responds to God appropriately. In fact, in dramatic form, except for Jonah. So where's my man Jonah? Verse number five says, goes on to say, but Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and falling sound. <laughs> Asleep. Okay? Jesus. Jonah has not only gone down to Joppa in the wrong direction, got on the boat, taking him as far away from God's ultimate direction as he possibly can get. But Jonah finds himself at peace. Oh, goodness. In his disobedience. While everybody else is in chaos because of what? His disobedience. Okay? Let me tell you something, something I did not intend to say to y'all. Gentlemen, men, you are the heads of your households. You are the leaders of your families. And oftentimes, our wives and our children, even our community, is in chaos. Why? Because you and I have decided to deliberately disobey God. And while everyone is running around responding to God in dramatic, appropriate form, you and I are not just somewhere asleep, but we are sound asleep because somehow you have disconnected yourself enough from God and his will that, that you do not see all the signs of chaos going on because of your sin. Don't miss this. To my son. Seth, Michael Boyer. Why my son? Because I've been challenging my son more recently. Pay attention to your daddy when he's preaching. My son is often doing something else when I'm preaching. And so last week, I noticed he was paying attention, looking at me the whole entire time. I went home and I said, hey, son, I appreciate you paying attention to me when I was preaching. What was your favorite part of the sermon? He said, Dad, I really don't know what you were talking about. <laughs> I said, you don't? He was like, I was looking at you, but I was bored. So... 
He likes it when I say his name, so I figured I would say his name this morning. Maybe he'll pay some attention to me, all right? I don't want to be boring, all right? It says here that, that Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Yes, I call my son's name because I remind my son his last name is Boyer. Boyer men will be there for their families. We will not only love our wives, we will be faithful to them, and we will commit ourselves to fathering our children. And so it is important for you guys as men to understand that there is a lot of chaos going on in our community all because men have decided to deliberately disobey God and his divine decrees. Finding yourself asleep which means you are disconnected, you are disjointed, you are in a situation where you do not hear God clearly, even though he is talking. Even though there is evidence of his work being done, you and I are missing it. So, gentlemen, wake up. Get up. And go do what God has called you to do. I know some of the men are saying, say something to the ladies. Y'all stop following these jack leg broke down jokers, all right? That's what y'all stop doing. All right. <laughs> they like that one. <laughs> all right. Gentlemen, I love you. But we need to hear the truth. We need to recognize that God has placed you in this position. Not me. God. He has made you the heads of your family. He has told you to lead in the right direction. And if there is chaos ensuing all around you, then stop looking at God and begin to look at the man in the mirror. Why? Because there's always two people in the room, you and God. And one of you have missed it. I guarantee you it was not God, which means it was just you. Jonah had gone down below in the hold of the ship, laying down and falling sound asleep. Now, it's not up here on the screen, but in verses 6 and 7, the captain will begin to roam around looking for every individual, all hands on deck, to somehow figure out what has taken place. He will find Jonah. He will tell Jonah to get up, go pray, for, pray to his God that they may not perish. Jonah will go up, and he is looking at the chaos that has taken place, and the men decide that they should cast lots to figure out Who's responsible for this calamity, all right? Those are verses 6 and 7. Read them at home when you get home, or you can read them quickly right now if you want to as I'm talking, but don't get lost there. Verse number 8, we read these words. Then they said to him, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? So they cast lots in verse number 7. Casting lots just simply means they pray to God, God revealed to us who is responsible for what's taking place. Now, when they pray, they're praying to their own gods and God in general because they're hoping that any god would answer them. Casting lots is like drawing straws. There are a bunch of straws that are short and one long one, and you just put them all on somebody's hand, you grab it, and then whoever has the longest one, that's how you know whose fault it is. Now, do I know that they actually cast or they, they drew straws? I don't know what they did. I don't know if they had rocks and they put, like, all the same rocks in the hand. We got the, I don't know, y'all. I just know what casting lots looks like in general. Somehow, somewhere, they came up with a way to identify or for God to identify whose fault or who was responsible for this situation. All the men cast lots, and the lots fall on Jonah. All of a sudden, now we want more deliberacy in this, but it's a deliberate diagnosis. The men begin to ask Jonah certain questions. Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us, number one? Number two, what is your occupation? They will go on to say in this particular verse, and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? In essence, these men are trying to gather enough information to figure out not only what has happened, but why this is happening. These men at this point, keep in mind, have been running around throwing the cargo that was in the ship into the sea. So they've thrown all their money or put money-making potential overboard. They're trying to lighten the load so that way the storm does not continue to cause the boat to break up, come apart, and they drown. Jonah was asleep. Jonah is awakened by the captain. Y'all know a little caveat here. Y'all, it said the boat was coming apart, right? Was it breaking up? You know, when a boat breaks up, that means water will come into the boat. You know where the water usually goes first, right? The bottom of the boat. Where was Jonah? Dog, gone there. He not only asleep, he asleep in water. Now, it's not a water bed, all right? 
but he'll sleep in water at the bottom of the boat. How do you sleep in the midst? That's just how, listen, that's sometimes just how far away you can be outside of God's will. You are totally disconnected. Totally disconnected from what he's trying to communicate to you. Jonah comes up on to the deck of the ship. The men are praying to their gods. Save us, Ra. Save us, Baal. Save us, whoever they're worshiping. Guess who's not praying? Jonah. You know why? Because he know why they're in this situation. It's his fault. The one person who's responsible for everything is the one person who ought to be praying who's not praying. Why? Because he was asleep, number one. Number two, he sees the chaos, and because he is so outside of God's will, deliberately, does not then pray to the God who can deliver all of them. So they begin to investigate. Who are you? Where you're from? What's your occupation? Why is this happening to us? Now, Jonah will tell them in the preceding verses or the following verses what has happened to them. And so we read in verse number uh, 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 10 these words. Then the men became extremely frightened. They said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. The men are drastically dismayed. What does it mean to be dismayed? It means that you are in a state of mind or in such a frenzy that you feel like all hope is gone. To be somewhat disoriented or dismayed means that you are alert and you see what is happening, but because what is happening is so bad or it is so overwhelming, you find yourself almost in a daze trying to figure out what to do next. These men are dismayed. They are without hope. Why? Because Jonah has told them that he is trying to escape the presence of his God. He will tell them, I serve a God who's the God of the sea. That's what he tells them in the verse prior to this. I'm escaping my God. He's the God of the sea. And, and they say, wait a minute. And you got on a boat? <laughs> All right. You mean your God controls all of this, and you jumped on a boat to try to escape his direction for your life, now putting us in a damaging and destructive situation where our lives are now on the line and death looks imminent, all because you did not want to do, let me be clear, what God has told you to do. The men knew that he was fleeing. Where? Where? From the presence of the Lord. Mm. Kingdom Life, I want you to see something here this morning. Yeah. Do you realize how many people and their lives are being affected by one man's decision to not want to go where God has sent him? See, all of these sailors, whether it is Five men, ten men, a dozen men, two dozen men. It won't be just them who are affected. It'll be their families that will be affected. If their families are affected, then that means their communities will also be greatly impacted. Because men who went off to work, who should have come back home, men who were doing what they knew to do, men who were not necessarily in disobedience to God, are dealing with one man who refuses to obey God. God. For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. He's made it very, very clear, Jonah has, to the men in whom are on this ship with him that this is his fault. The men will then say to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormier or it was getting worse and worse. The men now seek some direction. Some direction from who? Direction from Jonah. Why? Because obviously if it is his God who was disappointed, who was frustrated, who was upset, then maybe he can give us some direction on what we should do since we know that it is his God who was mad at him. They say, what should we do? How do we somehow get out of this, give us some direction. Now, I got to tell you right now, I don't know that I would, my first thought would be to ask Jonah. I might want to do some things with Jonah. 
But I don't know if it's really like, get me out of this. However, these men have enough spiritual wherewithal, enough sense to know that they hurt Jonah, then death may really be imminent. Jonah is the reason and the cause for the storm. Then potentially Jonah can also be the solution to the storm. The sea was becoming increasingly stormier. That means that the longer they were out there, it was getting worse and worse. Why? Because everything is responding to God except for preacher, the man of God. Jonah will look at these men and he will say to them, pick me up and throw me overboard. I thought running away was crazy. <laughs> okay? Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. Let me tell you something about disobedience. It not only like distracts you, but disobedience ultimately, it will, as we see here in the rest of verse 12, it goes on to say, um, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. Disobedience, it disorients you. What do I mean by that? God has given Jonah a command. Go to Nineveh. Jonah has decided to deliberately disobey God's command and make his way to Tarshish. What do you do when God finally gets your attention that you are not going in the direction that he has sent you in? i tell you what you do. You turn around and start going in a direction that he wants you to go in. That's why some of y'all came to church today. Okay? Some of y'all ain't seen in years. Some of y'all ain't seen ever. Okay? Some of y'all ain't seen in several weeks. I told y'all, it ain't been this full up in here for a while. And I thought, man, what's going on? But y'all, something happened. And y'all came running back, right? <laughs> See, when you know what God's direction is and you have gone in the opposite direction, then you know what to do. Just doing about face and now going the direction he has told you. Not Jonah. Jonah says, throw me overboard. Okay? And then he gives a reason. Because it's my fault. It's my fault. I did the crime, I should do the time. Okay? Now, how many folks y'all know feel like this? When they get caught. I mean, Jonah didn't turn himself in. He got caught. All right? And when you get caught, what do you say? It wasn't me. I ain't do it. Because, you know, if you admit that you did it, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And so Jonah is saying here, yes, the lot fell on me. I'm found out. What do we do now? Throw me overboard. Now, this is why I believe Jonah is not being sacrificial at this point, trying to make up for his mess up. Y'all, it said the Lord threw the wind onto the sea that caused such a storm. The boat is coming up, the ship, all right, is coming apart. And the men have thrown the reason for the trip that was in the boat into the sea because their lives are on. This ain't no regular storm, y'all. If Jonah goes overboard, you know what's going to happen? He's going to die. And Jonah would rather be dead than walk in obedience to the Lord. Okay. Now, let me be clear, because some of y'all are saying, Pastor, no, no, he nobody would choose death as opposed to, to obedience to the Lord. You're right. I think in some sense, Jonah is hoping that God would have grace and mercy on him because he knows the God and who he is and what God can do. And so if you throw him overboard, you know what? I still ain't got to go, but God might rescue me. And I'm here to tell you, many of us think like that. You engage in sinful activity and sinful practices, hoping that because God loves you, he's merciful and he's gracious, he will not judge you as harshly as he should and could. I'll give you grace. It's a lot of times what we think. And all we got to do is turn around and walk in the right direction. It's not even that hard. 
I mean, all he had to say was, hey, y'all, y'all turn the boat a couple of knots or, or degrees in this direction. Let's do a big U. -E. Take me back and drop me off at the same port that I found this boat and decided to go in the wrong direction. That's it. That's not what he said. Now, if you know the story, you know that the men don't want to do that. They decide to keep trying to get Jonah to safety, to, to, to rescue him. So they start rowing, verse 13 and 14, and the harder they row, the worse the storm gets. Wow. Okay? And so in, in verse 13, these men are trying to get him to safety, and it's like God is like, what are y'all doing? Don't be like Jonah. Fighting against the same God that Jonah's running away from. Then the men call on the Lord because they realize ain't no rescuing this guy. They call on Jonah's God. Said, so we earnestly pray, O oh Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. So now they're praying, asking for divine mercy to a God they've only been introduced to. But in the last moments of being in the midst of this storm and Jonah revealing to them who he is. Lord, don't kill us because your servant is crazy. Don't take us out because we are turning him over to your divine justice because no matter what we do, you will not let us make it on this journey with him in this boat. So they plead and ask God for his forgiveness. Don't let us perish on the man's account. Do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you have pleased. You know how many children are probably praying this prayer about their own parents? I wonder how many people in the city are waiting for the church to do something. But because we find ourselves in our own disobedience, we cannot effectively minister to people who really need us. These men are praying to a God they don't even know, asking for help and deliverance and mercy. Because God's man will not obey him. Well, story goes on as we wrap this up. We read verse 14, verse 15. So they picked Jonah up. They threw him into the sea. And notice here, the sea stopped its raging. They picked Jonah up. One for the money. Two for the show. Three to get rid Listen, it wouldn't take that that long. I'd have thrown Jonah overboard a long time ago, okay? All right? They pick him up, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped. Stopped. Now, in verse 16, these men, it's not up here on the screen, these men will begin to pray, call on Jonah's God, and, and pretty much believe all because of what they just saw happen. But it's not just a story that is now impacting them because Jonah has included them. The story is about Jonah. So in verse 17, we see the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. The word appointed here can also mean ordained. God ordained a great fish. A great fish just means a, it means a big fish, y'all. This is not a whale. That's Pinocchio. That's the wrong story. This is Jonah. Okay? And I'm here to tell you that many people have done a lot of research. There is no fish scientifically that we are aware of that is this big that can swallow a person. Now, maybe a whale can, but not a fish. And this is where some people say the Bible must be wrong. You can't believe it. Read the text closely. God, the Lord, ordained or appointed a great fish. Okay? All right? This fish showed up because it is doing the exact opposite of what Jonah was doing. It's obeying the Lord. Now, I don't know if God decided to create the fish for this moment and say, hey, this is your job. You got one purpose in your existence. Swallow this man, and here you go. Or if the fish was just swimming around somewhere in the ocean and they got the, the memo from God, it's time for your destiny. But what I can tell you is I believe it was a fish because they didn't say whale, and whale existed in Jonah's times. They didn't say whale, a fish. Number one, number two, because this fish was ordained, appointed by God. That's right. There's some fish that were ordained and appointed in your life to swallow you up. Okay? All right? Okay? 
And I get it. Some of y'all are like, well, what's my fish? Whatever it is, that thing that God used to rescue you from your deliberate, deliberate disobedience to direct your paths in the right way. Okay? The fish is not the punishment. The fish is what God appoints for Jonah to be rescued. The fish swallows him. Now I'm going to get some more of this story in the next couple of weeks because y'all seem engaged, like you want the rest of it. You can't just go home and read the Bible and you figure out what the rest of it is. I'll tell you some more of the story in the weeks to come. So for those of you who visit for the first time, I guess I'll see you next week. Matter of fact, we're not going to stream next week. You're going to have to come. No, I'm joking. The Lord appoints this this great fish to, to swallow Jonah, okay? He appoints, he ordains, he sends. And so that means that this fish is appointed by God. It is sent by God. It's created by God. It's sent by God. But God's hand is in the details of this fish swallowing up Jonah, okay? Now I want you to see what happens next. And Jonah sat in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Notice how titled it, Disheartened Prophet. Now, why do I title it this way? Because I'm trying to imagine, what do you do for three days in the belly of a fish? I mean, I know if you go to the doctors and they tell you, hey, you got to have surgery or you got a procedure, and for three days, you know, you can't do much. You and I would sit in hospital bed or we would do outpatient surgery, go home, and we would sit on our couch or sit in our beds and we would just watch Netflix all day. Why? Because you have a reason to sit and binge watch whatever it is you want to watch. You would have people waiting on you, whether you got a spouse, kids, or somebody was helping you out, get you some food, make sure you were taken care of as you're sitting there. And as disheartening as that can be, as disappointing as it can be, to not be able to have the freedom to move, at least there is someone there to help you out. Now for Jonah, what do you do for three days and three Somebody said pray. No, that's what I think Jonah was doing. Y'all seen that statue? (laughs) Why do I think that's what Jonah is doing? What else is there to do? When you find yourself not only sitting in the consequences of your sin, but you can't even go nowhere. And that's where I want to leave you today, Kingdom Life, because I believe there are some of you who are in here today. This is what you're doing. Sitting. (laughs) Contemplating. How did I get here? What am I supposed to do now to get out of here? Some of you wish God would just take you out right now. But he won't. So you just have to sit. But don't miss the blessing in sitting in your mess. Sure, it's like sitting in your own dirty diaper. It's warm. It's comfortable. But it also stinks. Mm. By sitting in it, you're less likely to sit in it again. Mm. By sitting in the consequences of your sin and the struggle that God has been going through to save you from you and your decision. To choose that bad relationship over him. To choose that drug, those drugs, that alcohol. All right. Some of us got good jobs and struggle to give God any real portion of what really belongs to him. All right. Some of us fail to read our Bibles. Heck, it'd be hard to show up once a week on a Sunday. 
So guess what? You find yourself sitting. Sitting in what? The consequences of your sin. If you're sitting today, let me leave you with this. The hope that you have is that the Lord allowed you to sit. He could have taken you out. He could have let the storm that he threw on the sea, that rocked the boat, that challenged the men, that eventually got you thrown overboard. He could allow that storm to take you out. Yet you're still here. So as you sit in silence, consequences of sin, the hope, the hope that you have that the Lord is the one who appointed the fish that you're sitting in so that way it can redirect you. And you can decide today whether or not you will stay in disobedience or begin to walk in obedience. Your takeaways this morning are very, very simple. What is it that I'm trying to get you to see? I'm trying to get you to see that in Jeremiah 29, 7, God tells his people to get comfortable. They're going to be there for a while. Because you're going to be here for a while, seek the welfare of the city in which you are in. Seek its benefit. Seek for it to be blessed. Hope for it to get better. Why? Because in its getting better, in its being blessed, in it being benefited, you'll also find your benefit your blessing, you being better. I know for some of you are going to say, well, I mean, that was Israel specifically in the Old Testament at a time period in which the people have been rebellious against God and he has put them in a place of captivity. Okay, that's fine. Matthew chapter 10 says this when Jesus tells his disciples, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can't sit. You got to go. Where's he sending his disciples? Into the city to go tell people the kingdom of God is at hand. He goes on to say, heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. One of my favorite ones, cast out demons. That's right. Demons still exist today, y'all. Okay? All right? Some of y'all brought some in here with you. Here you go. Just don't leave here with them. Leave them here at the altar. So you leave here, you leave here cleansed, you leave here whole. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely, freely you have received your salvation. Freely share it, give it to those who are in need of it. Where do you do that? In the city. How do I know? Because we all saved up in here. That's why we're here. Let's take it out there. Because in doing this, in doing this, we do not walk in disobedience, we walk in obedience. Hmm. Don't miss this, everybody. Disobedience. Disobedience does three things based upon what we just saw in today's sermon. Number one, disobedience will distract. It will distract you from what is really going on in the life around you. Disobedience not only distracts you and I, disobedience also disorients us. Because at times we can see the chaos of sin and we're so in a place of so distant that we forget that all we got to do is start to follow him as opposed to keep running from it. And finally, disobedience, oh, it disheartens. Why? Because oftentimes you have to sit in the silence of your sin chaos and the confusion of your own decision to go against the Lord. 
not only does it dishearten you, but it disheartens all those who are being impacted by our decision not to do his will. So this morning, I want to challenge all of us, encourage all of us, do what God is telling you to do. Let us be a blessing to our city. Stop being distracted by what they're doing. Stop focusing on the unrighteousness and the wickedness in it. Focus on the righteousness and the hope of what could be in it. As we, God's people, take what's been given to us and freely give it to those around us. This is the word of our God. Hear it, believe it, and receive it on today. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are, how you continue to work in all of our lives. Draw us closer to you that we may hear your word and your truth. We will continue to work in the midst of not only our lives, but even at times our disobedience to draw us closer to you. Lord, I thank you that in all of this, in Jonah's disobedience, you still demonstrate your divine grace and mercy. You still love him, and you're still willing to get him back, to get him back on track. Help us, your sons and your daughters. If we are off track to get back on track, if we are on track to stay on track, so that way we do not walk in disobedience, running away from you or from the city you've called us to, with great joy and expectation, running to the city you've called us to, doing exactly what you've told us to do. And we'll be very, very careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, Listen, we don't want to end our service without giving the opportunity to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. The Bible declares that you and I are all sinners in need of a Savior. A Savior is Jesus Christ. The Bible lets us know that one sin is one too many to be in his presence. That means if you made one mistake, you've missed the perfect mark in just one way, then you are not good enough to be in God's presence. But the Bible also communicates that God loved you and I so much Overwhelmed by his love and his desire to have not just a relationship, but eternal relationship with you and me. He sends God the Son, Jesus Christ, to the face of this earth to live a perfect life and then die shedding his blood on the cross. Three days later, Jesus gets up, overcoming death, overcoming his power and his sting. And as he's ascending, he informs, he reminds his disciples that you go out and you tell people to believe in me because if they believe in me, they too can overcome death. Today, if you want to know that if you died, you would go to heaven then make the decision today to believe on Jesus Christ, our Lord. If this is you this morning, but there's a prayer. There's a way for you to not only invite God into your heart, but to know that if you die today, you go to heaven. This is you, and you want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Bow your heads. Pray this prayer with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Lord, I invite you into my heart today. Asking that you would take over my life and that you would save my soul. I believe that Jesus came. I believe that he died. I believe that he arose. And today, I make him my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who are looking to recommit, you're already a believer, already a Christian. You've heard the story. You've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, but for a season, you've been away, kind of wandered astray a little bit. There's a story in the Bible called The Prodigal Son where the son wanders away and squanders what his father has given him. But he comes to himself and he realizes that if he returns back home, he can experience the joy, the peace, the comfort, the salvation of his father's home. And so he returns. He never stopped being his father's son. He was just simply out of fellowship with his father. Today, if you're coming back, Acknowledging that you have wandered away, but today you are returning home. There's a prayer for you also. If this is you, pray this with me, every head bowed, every eye closed. My Father and my God in heaven, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for keeping me whole, even when I wandered away. 
Today I return back home. Once again, placing my hand into your hand, asking that you lead me, lead me the rest of the way home. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Kingdom Life Church's YouTube channel. Yes, thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you here in person sometime soon. God bless. Yeah. <laughs>